I've found when you aren't content with your life or your current situation, you may find yourself constantly chasing that feeling. And that usually results in throwing money after stuff or after like events in an attempt to buy happiness. And that rarely works. So finding contentment and where you are and what you already have can be a great way to accelerate your FI journey and just to lower stress, lower spending, just overall is, is good for life. You want to clean the slate. You don't carry any judgment or guilt about your past spending. That is not going to help get your future going any faster. So I think forgiveness and patience are key. Like when you do your first budget, it's not going to be perfect. When you do your second one, it's still not going to be perfect. But you're you're getting used to the process and sticking with it is a great way. But yeah, there there's no guilt. I think that's a good tip for late starters and people that are catching up with FI is to assess like can I keep my clothes longer? Can I keep my car longer? Is there the opportunity to downsize? Do I really need this? Because then everything you save and don't have to spend, that's more money to put into retirement now that many years earlier. Welcome to Catching Up to Fi, a podcast on mindset, money, and life for late starters of any age on their journey to financial independence. I'm Bill, and I'm a late starter. I'm Becky, and I'm also a late starter, and we're your hosts. We're here to help you with your journey to financial independence, no matter where you're starting from. We're going to talk to experts, other late starters, and explore topics related to our mission. Join us as we catch up to FI together. Hello, guys, and welcome back to Catching Up to Fi. I'm Bill Yound with my co-host, Becky Heptig, and today we're talking about Becky's favorite subject. And no, it's not Bill's sinking funds. It's <laughs> Becky's budget. We should Yay! probably have a series on budget with <laughs> Becky. She actually put out on the Facebook group this last week, her own transparent budget, her numbers. Take a look at those and you'll learn that it's, it's certainly possible. But we're here today to talk with Lauren. How are you doing today, Lauren? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah. We were introduced by a good friend of mutual friend of ours, B.C. Krogowski, who's an author, a physician, and uh, has written her own book on how to fire and how to uh, spend your money wisely so that you can fire more early in life. Let me make a little introduction because people don't know who you are, but they're going to learn real fast that you are a budget nista, a maven of budgets. Bill, before you do, we need to tell folks that in a few days, you are actually going to be leaving the country and living your best life in where? We're going to Morocco for my wife's 60th birthday. Oh, nice. That's right. Yeah, That's and, right. And, and you'll, you'll be glad to know that there's a large sinking fund that's <laughs> taking care of the trip. <laughs> Paid for in cash. There were days that we paid for trips and credit card and, well, lots of days, and then caught up to the credit card bill, which is ass backwards from the way you are supposed to do it, and at least our community. And we're trying to get more people to think this way. So tell your friends what we're doing here. Get those friends outside of the community to join us and learn the FI way to do things as opposed to the paycheck to paycheck way. That's right. So you and Karen have a wonderful time while you're gone. And Mark and I are going to hold down the fort while you're having your best life in Morocco. Yeah, I'm going to do my best to be offline and focused on the present, the moment, and being there with our friends who are traveling with us. Oh, nice. So we're going to spend... Uh, days in some of the cities and then days in the rural part and the mountainous part of Morocco. And then we're going to spend a couple of nights in the desert in a Bedouin tent, which we're very excited about. Oh, better you than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I have fun with that. <laughs> well, it's definitely glamping. They actually have a bathroom and running water because it's near sort oh, of in a way. So yes. we're not going to suffer. I'm, I'm at the age 58 and my wife's at the age 60 where we're not sleeping on the ground yeah. anymore. I'm my, not doing my, that. 
Yeah. <laughs> my back can't take it. It's a different season of life. Yes, it's cost more, but comfort is worth it, right? That's yes, right. That's oh, right. And, and we hack miles. We hack miles, so we're flying business class. You two can do that well. And yes. talk to Becky, you'll hack Southwest miles, mm -hmm. but we're United Miles people, and we're very fortunate to be able to lay down flat on our trip to Morocco. Oh, I'm jealous. I was totally <laughs> jealous. <laughs> I, when, right before we flew to Bali, I asked a friend that flies United all the time. Oh, uh, okay. What's the, well, he flies a lot. Not that he flies United, but he flies a lot all the time. And I said, what is the secret to these uh, long haul flights? And he said, Polaris class. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, okay, you're no help at all. <laughs> well, you were vertical most of the way there, right? Yes, yes. Our seats did not lay flat. They were nice seats, but they did not lay flat. So, yeah, right. I'm totally well, jealous. All right, so here we go with Lauren. All right, so Lauren grew up in a family surrounded by accountants. She learned from prepping 1040 returns at a young age that she did not want to follow the family trend. She ended up becoming a bookkeeper instead, working in finance and helping small businesses since her teenage years. Lauren has always been fascinated with numbers and patterns. With over 15 years of experience, she's excited to take the knowledge she's learned in industries spanning aviation, investment firms, motorsports, Becky, Yay. and retail. <laughs> <laughs> Focusing on where her true passion lies, personal finance, sole proprietorships, and small businesses. She's a previous Financial Peace University coordinator and loves helping friends and colleagues with personal finance questions. It became an inside joke at her last corporation position that an unofficial employee benefit working there was free access to budget with belts, <laughs> which has now become the budget brigade. And we'll talk about that. Lauren splits her free time between her two passions, money and stories. When she isn't working the analytical side of her brain at the Budget Brigade, you can find her spinning up her creative side, writing and editing at Lauren Belt's Writes. My friend, B.C. Kurgowski, introduced me to Lauren, and she reached out to us on Catching Up to Fi on the website last fall and told us about her passion for Fi and budgeting. This has been a long time coming, but we finally found the time, so we are glad to welcome Lauren Belt to the show. Thanks so much. And I'm so glad to be here today talking with you. Well, this is our second episode on budgeting, but we wanted this in sort of the first quarter of the year so that people could get their act together and spend the year prospectively thinking about their money. Mm -hmm. But take a moment here, Lauren, tell us a little bit about your background, your passions, and your financial story and journey. Yeah, so like the intro said, I grew up in a family of accountants. My mom's an accountant, my dad's an accountant, my aunt's an accountant, my grandpa's an accountant. So naturally, I went to college and got an engineering degree. <laughs> and that is actually where I met my husband. We met as like broke college students trying to get by on the least amount of student loans possible. Luckily, we have two pretty cheap hobbies like video games and books, which can be reread and reused. And I have the library, which is one of my favorite frugal hacks to keep up with my reading addiction. And then I spend a lot of time writing. We love to travel. So when you're talking about Morocco, I'm looking forward for our 10th anniversary next year. We have already done seeking funds for our trip to Norway. So we will also <laughs> be going Viking. We're like, do the big trip nice. And then we do the rest like Carnival Cruise the rest of the time. But we will be sitting vertical the whole way to, <laughs> to London and back from Oslo. But that's all right. <laughs> Well, I haven't been to Norway yet, but I know from the pictures, it's absolutely beautiful. Those fjords and the small towns, I know you'll have a fantastic time. Yeah, we're going to chase the northern lights. We kind of pushed it around the anniversary, so it's going to be really cold for Floridians, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, well, off-season travel is cheaper, right? Yes, yep. It definitely was. And nice. so, yep, that's us. And then we are Dink Wads, which is the new term we learned. So dual income, no kids with a dog. And our dog, Starbuck, is now affectionately known as the Budget Beagle. <laughs> <laughs> I saw his picture on your website. <laughs> yes, she gets paid in pepperoni to pose for photos. And my husband's into like the AI imaging and stuff. So he kind of tries to get her near the fire station, which we won't actually take her to because that would be an emergency in its own situation of her causing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my.
my goodness. So you said you got an engineering degree. Yes, I worked in corporate or I never worked in corporate engineering. Like I could tell I was not a sit in a cubicle kind of person. Mm -hmm. I worked for a company that designed DTG, so direct to garment printers for a while. But I really wanted to get into motorsports. So I knew when I went, I had kind of asked people and they're like, anybody can get a PR degree. Marketing's going to be harder. You want to get an engineering degree. So I went to engineering school without actually knowing what an engineer did, just because I wanted to play with race cars. And so I was very fortunate. It took a couple years of just sending in resumes, kind of pounding the pavement. But I got that opportunity and that in, and I really got to enjoy my first stint of my career working in that. It was a lot of fun, and it's a lot easier in your 20s. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> glad I did it young. <laughs> well, you may not know uh, Becky's story, but she has a passion for race cars. Yeah, I think you mentioned a little bit. Is it a Porsche that you race? Yes, yes. We literally don't race, but mm -hmm. there's to folks on the outside, there's not a big difference. But we drive high-speed driving events at the track. Nice. So we Very just cool. drive under a different set of rules is all. But yes, Stephen has an older 911 Carrera that he drives, and I've got a Cayman S. So, yep. Very and then nice. you and I were talking about Indy earlier before mm -hmm. we got on the recording and Stephen and I are following Formula One. So, okay. Yeah. My yeah. dad grew up and lived in like Speedway and Bluffton, Indiana. So we're IndyCar people at heart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Becky is Phi and she lives the Phi life, but she still drives Porsches, which is fascinating because just like Ramit Sethi says, spend lavishly on your passions and yes. then be frugal with the rest. And as Paula Pant says, and we just talked to her, <laughs> that you can afford anything as Becky does, but not everything. everything. And I look forward to the Paula Pant interview, but here, we're here today with our friend Lauren and she is the fire person, but she has a unique thing called the fire ladder. And we wanna take you through that mm -hmm. today because it's a very, easy path to follow. And we got, what, eight rungs here, Lauren? And you yes. just get us started and tell us about rung one. Yeah, absolutely. So rung one is to ignite your journey. You want to determine your goal and that will help you build motivation to reach it. So your goal is kind of what do you want from life? Not even just from money, not even retirement, but what vision do you have for your life, your career? And on the finance side, like what are you hoping to achieve? Because money is great, but money is a resource that gets you to where you want to go. It shouldn't be the finish line. So I hear a lot of people say like, I want to be a millionaire. And it's like, okay, why? Like, what do you want to do with that million dollars? I don't know. It would just be nice to have. And it's like, okay, well, that's hard to get to if you don't have a good motivation why. So we really start with having a goal because we think that's a great way to reverse engineer your path to get you to where you want to go. Well, you talk about the why, and this is really the why of I. We don't think about it a lot. We don't think about the why of what we want to do, what we want to be, what our personal goals are too. And just like you said, without a destination, you have no direction, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And those True. goals can be different. Right now, we have two current goals. One is to kind of, and I love this phrase, own our time, not just our stuff. And that takes money. But our motivation is we want to never have to worry about paying our bills. And then this kind of created many goals of building up a substantial emergency fund for my personal peace of mind. So we have closer to like 12 months versus the normal three to six months people recommend. Goal was to pay off our house so we didn't have any debt or obligations. We could live cheaper, afford more opportunities. And it also means we're ensuring we always live below our means so that if one of us has a job loss, we can stretch to make it work. And then, of course, the big one is financial independence, but that's kind of our why behind it. And the other main goal for us is we want to move out to Red Rock Country, which is one we're actually currently in the process of, which is exciting. Your goals can change as you go and as you hit different ones on your way up the ladder. So since we maintain mm -hmm. that stability of financial freedom, that involves a lot of spreadsheets and planning to make sure we account for 
a cost of living adjustment so that we're realistic with where we go. Like we love Colorado, but we have more a Loveland budget versus a Boulder budget or a downtown Denver budget. Um, and we want to be able to do that moving cash without touching our emergency fund or our retirement accounts. Yeah, I mean, you may even move to the Capital of Phi, Longmont, right? Yeah. You'd be, a perfect, you'd be a perfect addition to that community. That's where Amberly Grant is. And Becky, after the, this is going to have aired after Becky's gone on the FinTox cruise with oh, nice. Amberly and a lot of the Capital of Phi out there in Denver and Colorado with 60 of their best friends on a cruise with mm -hmm. FinTox, mm -hmm. right? That's right. That's right. And so you've got Carl and Mindy out there and Pete. And yeah, there's a there's a lot of folks out there. You would love it. Yeah. But I'm excited for you to come to Colorado because you and I can meet in person. Yes. Yeah. Talk more budgeting. I always right. love seeing right. other people's methods. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Lauren, one of the things you mentioned was your goals. And I love that. And that brings up the point of not everybody's goals are going to look the same. There's not like this template of goals that somebody can go look at. So your goals are what you mentioned, my goals, I'm at a whole different place in life. And so everybody needs to really spend some time at the beginning of this process thinking yes. about what those goals are. And as Bill said, the why of I. Yeah, absolutely. Personal finances is just that. It's very personal. It's almost weird if you have the same goals as someone else. A lot of people's goals are to help put their kids through college or to pay for their kid's wedding, to be able to retire in five years. And I think the more specific you can be with that goal by having like a timeline or a dollar amount, at least an approximate mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. is a big deal because then the more concrete your goals are, the more capable you are of figuring out that path to get there. Right. Oh, and late starters, late starters may not have those kind of goals because it's more like a live in the present paycheck to paycheck, I'm going on this trip, and then we'll figure out what happens next. There's mm -hmm. really, for us at least, and it may be true for others, there was no strategy. There was, okay, we're going to live in Chicago, a high cost of living area. We're going to just afford that lifestyle with our high incomes. We're going to go on all these great trips. We're going to pay for our kids. We wanted to have everything without affording everything. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. was sort of the reverse of Paula Pant's mo motto. And it didn't work. We had to eventually wake up and realize that, hey, you're very intentional with your spending. Look at you. You're in Orlando now. You've paid off your house and you're going to move in cash to Colorado to an affordable geo arbitraged location. Yeah. It's not like, oh, I want to live in downtown Denver. And then all of a sudden, my savings rate goes down. My gap goes down. You're minding the gap strategically with how you move. We got lucky. We uh, downsized and geo arbitrage without knowing what it was. We went from Chicago to Tennessee because of a, a job opportunity and the cost of living dropped dramatically. We lost state taxes and got that six to eight percent pay raise <laughs> from all the taxes in Cook County and Illinois. So we accidentally did what we needed to do and then realized after the fact that we had done absolutely the right thing. And these are some of the hard decisions that people have to make. Uh, you live in 1,200 square feet, right? I mean, we lived in 4,500 square feet with our twin boys, and we didn't need it all. Luckily, we have a lot of great memories. We had the boat, just like Becky. We had all the trappings of the high-end lifestyle without n knowing when or taking care of our future selves and knowing when, hey, we want to retire someday. And then we woke up at 50 saying, it's close. We got to do something about this. And we've been making great headway. But I love the fact that you're very intentional with your why. I have to ask, yeah, your parents were accountants, but how the heck did you become good with money at a young age? A lot of that was the frugal mindset my mom had. Like we would go into stores and like I was trained, we go straight to the clearance aisle. Like we don't stop at the full price tags. If it doesn't have a colored sticker on it, it's not for us. And I learned about couponing and BOGOs early. But also I think 
engineering school helped. My friends always ask, like, do you feel bad you went to engineering school and don't actually use your degree? And it's like, I use it all the time, just not in the normal sense of the way. It really teaches you how to follow a process on how to implement and how to iterate. So I think that mentality has really helped with mm -hmm. personal finances and <laughs> developing spreadsheets and all that fun stuff. But I think too, I'm fortunate. I'm a natural saver and I've found ways to be cheap. I've seen kind of what money struggles can do when you're a small business owner or when you're a normal American family. And I just set out early. I did not want to repeat that and let that be my life. And so it was a lot of intentionality up front. But I think starting out not being a high income earner, because I've never made six figures, even in engineering, I didn't go into to corporate engineering where the big money is after graduation. So I was kind of forced at an early age, how to set that up. And then luckily it's minding the lifestyle creep young. I had babysitting in high school. One of my neighbors I babysat for something he said really resonated with me. And he goes, when you graduate engineering school, you're going to get that first big paycheck and it's going to seem like all the money in the world. But once you add in a car payment and a house payment and kids and a horse, he's like, it's gone pretty quick. So the cheaper you can keep your life early, the better. And that really hit me like that advice in high school before I had the opportunity to spend and rack up a lot of debt. Yeah, I mean, just like you say, it takes one person. Yeah. I did not have that one person that said, I mean, Fritz Gilbert told us, and I remember it very well, his first boss said, max out your 401k. That's all he said. And mm -hmm. that forever mm -hmm. changed his life. I think for late starters, nobody says that. And right. that's sort of the typical. Your parents don't say it. Your first boss doesn't say it. Your friends don't say it because you're surrounded by the consumption Joneses in our society. Yeah. It, it's hard to it's hard to break out of that. And it's certainly possible. And our community has done it. So I want to encourage them that they've found their why and they can do it. That's what we're all about. You can do it as a late starter. The path is generally the same, but you just happen to get on it early, right? Yeah. Yep. And that kind of feeds into rung two and three. So I'll jump on two real quick. Two is to assess the smoke. So you want to evaluate your current situation. Like you said, you kind of forced arbitrage without realizing it to downsizing. But on rung two, once you have your goal, it's like, okay, where am I at on my path to my goal? How much do I have in retirement? What is my net worth? Do I have a budget? And this is my personal favorite because this is where your budget comes into play. And it also is start doing that mindset shift. Okay, what can we change to jump ahead that we hadn't realized before? And then on step three is fortify your fire station. And that's where you get community. So if you don't have that person that is speaking in to your life with good, but you're surrounded by people that don't have good money mentality or uses, they might be people you don't want to hang out with as much and get yourself into the catching up with FI community instead, because having those people as your support group can be really great as you put out like the dumpster fire of your finances and build to your freedom fire on your FI journey. I have dumpster fire socks. Oh, that's and, awesome. <laughs> my friends and colleagues at work, I have a lot of fun socks. And but one of them, my favorite to wear is the dumpster fire. And our finances were a dumpster fire. Mm -hmm. And and you talk about assessing the smoke. And so you gotta assess your dumpster fire. And other things you talk about is creating a GPS and balancing your today's spending with your goals for tomorrow. Looking at frugal fun things to do as opposed mm -hmm. to the expensive things that end up being a paycheck to paycheck fun thing. And the one thing we are repeatedly try to emphasize in our community and you do as well in rung two is no shame. Yes. Right. You want to clean the slate. You don't carry any judgment or guilt about your past spending. That is not going to help get your future going any faster. So I think forgiveness and patience are key. Like when you do your first budget, it's not going to be perfect. When you do your second one, it's still not going to be perfect. But you're you're getting used to the process and sticking with it 
is a, a great way. But yeah, there there's no guilt. I've seen that in some of our budgeting sessions. People are always like, okay, before I send these to you, like, don't judge me about it. I, I had a rough month. And I was like, there's no judgment here. We're here to help. Like, this is not to shame you. That doesn't solve anything for anyone. Right. Right. So in, in number three, rung number three, fortify your fire station, you talk about some of the things that you need to get in place, like your emergency fund and some insurance. Tell us about that real quick. Yeah. So your emergency fund, I see a lot of times people call your emergency fund, like your rainy day fund. I don't like that term. Your emergency fund is more of the scene in the day after tomorrow when all of New York is flooding. That kind of like rain and flood, not just a little bit of rain outside. It covers really big emergencies, not just little hiccups that you can cash flow. So we have our setup in a completely separate bank that doesn't have auto draft and it takes like three days to get money out of it. Like we make it really hard to touch that. So we're motivated to leave it alone. And then for insurance, like it's a fact of life that life is going to kick you in the teeth at some point. So Mm -hmm. it helps to have a mouth guard in and that mouth guard is your insurance. I live in Florida right now. So every hurricane season is a prime example of why insurance matters. I think either a year or two ago, we got 22 inches of rain in 12 hours and houses had Water flooded up six feet, apartment complexes flooded to the second floor, and most people can't afford to completely replace their house and everything in it in a natural disaster like that. So insurance is key to help you fortify from future dumpster fires happening to you in your process of putting out the fire you already have and reaching your financial independence. Yeah, I want to uh, turn people back to an episode that's already aired with Chris Hutchins. We go through hacking all of these insurances that are so important. So if you're hearing this one first, rewind and go back to that episode and learn about all the important defenses that you need to put in place because offense comes second, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, we want to get insurance and emergency funds in place before we do anything else because without out defense, you're you're too split. You're trying to do offense and defense with, with one team and they're just exhausted and they pass out on the court. If I may divulge something for Becky, I mean, a lot of folks in the late start community may not be able to afford insurance at times. Becky, you had these issues, right? Yes. When, uh, when Stephen was working for himself, there was a short period of time that we went without health insurance. And I look back on it now and it kind of scares the crud out of me that we did that, but that's where we were at the time. And we did finally purchase one of the ministry sharing. It's not a policy, but we joined one of those so that we had catastrophic coverage. And that's what you want to think about with insurance. I mean, sometimes people actually buy insurance that they don't need. And as you said, Lauren, you can cover some things just by cash flowing from your emergency fund. So you want to transfer the risk of the big ticket items, the things that you, like your house burns down or it floods Mm -hmm. or your car is totaled, the things that you can't manage on your own, you want to transfer that risk to the insurance company. And one of them that we talked about with uh, Chris was long-term disability. And that's something that in younger folks, they don't really think they need, but Mm -hmm. you're more likely to become disabled than a lot of other things that could happen to you. So there's certain insurances that you really need to have in place. And then some that you may be paying for that you actually don't need at all. So it's a good evaluation point. Yeah, one of the things we focused on with Morocco, now that we're older (laughs) and going into the desert, is travel insurance. And Mm -hmm. Becky gave me the recommendation. Mm -hmm. I'll throw that out there. Geo Blue. It is not expensive. And you're going on an expensive trip. Yeah. And this is something, and this happened to a friend of ours on the trip. Her knee went out. She has a knee replacement. And she, instead of going on the trip, she needs to replace her knee again. So we lost a couple to this Mm -hmm. trip uh, because of a health issue. Or say you have a health issue while on the trip. How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to get home to get first world health care? Say you die on the trip, for heaven's sakes. How do you repatriate your body? These are all expenses you do not think about. It's a little morbid, but and we think we're immortal. And up till now, I've had no travel insurance. And yeah, everything's gone fine. 
but right, I, right, uh, us I too. Guess. Yeah, when but yeah, you start reaching the age where we are, and it's like I really need to think about these things because it could totally happen. So, yeah. all right, so let's move on. More. Left four is to extinguish the inferno of your dumpster fire. So that includes a couple different things. The primary one is paying off debt. What you do, this is where personal finances is personal again. Like which ones you do kind of depends on your goals. Definitely prioritize the high interest debt like credit cards because apart from like a 50% or 100% employer match at work, you aren't going to find a higher ROI than what you're paying in credit card interest. So that's a definite for anybody that Mm. has that kind of debt. After that, it kind of becomes more personal. One of our goals was to be completely unchained and not to have any obligations. So we paid off everything, including our house. Depending on where you are in your FI journey, uh, depending on what other sources of income streams you have coming in, that might not be something you want to do, especially if you still have the beautiful golden handcuffs of those 2% interest rates from back in the day that thankfully we didn't have that one, which was more motivation to pay off. But that Mm -hmm. can be a, a little more personal in that one. But The higher ones, anything where you're paying more in interest than you're going to make in investments, cap compounding interest is working against you, not for you. So you're still kind of net negative. So the more of that you can get out of your life, the more payments you can free up to spend for yourself. And so that's the aspect for your money. The same is true for your time. If we spend all of our time on obligations for things that don't align with what we believe or what we want, one, that can make us a lot more anxious and it can eat away at our soul. So again, that depends on what do you want, what obligations are in your life. Like that can be a job. That can be relationships. That can be those people we were talking about that are bad with money and they kind of draw you into that lifestyle. And I realize at this point, if you're in a lot of debt and you're at the beginning of your catching up with FI journey, like you might not be in the position to just leave your job if it's not serving anymore. Sometimes there is a hustle and grind at the beginning. So I do appreciate that, but it's something to start being mindful of at this point in the journey. And not every time, not every job that you leave is going to take a pay cut. You might actually end up with a better opportunity with a better balance that pays you more. So it's something to start exploring, even if you can't capitalize on it just yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we like to talk about the efficient frontier of the risk reward of investing, where for more risk, you get more reward. And in some ways, there's an efficient frontier of debt management, <laughs> where for the high interest rate debts, you have a lot of reward. And uh, the reward moves down as you move up the risk spectrum where the risk becomes less. And there's a parabolic or partially parabolic efficient frontier and you can take it to the negative side and do the same kind of thing with the efficient frontier and realize that, hey, let's take care of these things. Because there's basically a zero to 5% low risk, low interest rate position where maybe that's your mortgage, maybe you can hold off on that and earn more, just like you said. And then there's kind of the 5% middle range of interest rates where that is personal. And how important is it to you to move that risk downward? And then above 10%, it's really a no brainer yeah. as to paying that off. It is the most important thing you can do, but you don't want to miss your match, at least in investing. People always say, should I save or should I invest? Do you have a comment on that and how you sort of rule of thumb, how you figure out, how do I do both? Should I do both? Or how does that look for saving and investing simultaneously? Um, Like you said, if you have an employer match that's like 50 or 100%, that's going to beat out any other return. So if you have the space in your budget to do that and have some left over to tackle debt, like I love that balance. Go ahead and take that match. Start flexing that muscle of getting retirement going and then tackle the high interest debt. Once you're done with that, like 
when we paid off our house, we didn't spend every single dollar we had coming in. Like we set a guideline, okay, we're going to take at least up to the match here. We're going to fully fund our Roth IRAs to keep that going. We had a certain percentage goal. I think we were at least doing 15 or 20% into that. And whatever was left there went to the mortgage. And so for us, we looked at like, okay, what are our actual needs and wants? And where can we cut out from there versus stealing from our future for our goal for today. So it's definitely an opportunity cost balance, but we tried to at least capitalize on some of the tax advantage and a thousand percent took the full match that we could get at work. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the term opportunity cost, and I had no idea what this term is. And a lot of our audience may not understand it. For example, I think Warren Buffett talks about the opportunity cost of buying a new couch when his wife asked for one. Mm -hmm. What does opportunity cost mean? And what do what is the real cost of a thing? It's funny, we talk in our house, it is pizzas, playstations, and we were going to do Teslas, but we lose the alliteration. So we went with Pontiacs. But <laughs> like, and a lot of times we'll equate it to our job. Like if we're assessing, should I buy this? It's like, how many hours of work is that going to cost us? Like how many hours of work do I have to do to be able to afford this thing? And then for other things, it's like, okay, this purchase costs us five pizzas or this purchase equates to a PlayStation. Like those things that we're a lot more familiar with that have a dollar sign kind of saved and ingrained in our brain. And that's kind of how we balance it. And to your point, like you said with Paula, you have the opportunity most of the time to do anything, but you can't do it all at once. So you have to balance the opportunity cost of what do I want to do now and what can wait for later. So like I would have loved to buy a truck and a camper and taken like a three week vacation and road tripped our way to Colorado. But when I looked at the money, we don't have a truck or a camper yet. And I was like, if we do that, we have to wait two more years. So which one do we want to do mm. now? And or do we want to wait and do both? And for us, the the move was more important. So we're like, we'll get the camper once we get settled in out there. There will still be plenty of opportunities to vacation later. Yeah, an opportunity cost really in the true cost of a thing is the compounding of that money you spend now. And that's why Rob Berger talks about in one of his episodes that you know, a car is a true fire buster. Oh. If you're going to buy the $40,000 car or more, as opposed to the ten to twenty thousand dollar car, you're losing out on the compounding of the difference uh, for potent, you know, mm -hmm. twenty, thirty, forty years, which becomes a significant amount of money. So you've got to think about what's the total and future cost of the thing I'm buying now. Right. Yeah, and I think that's a good tip for late starters and people that are catching up with FI is to assess like. Can I keep my clothes longer? Can I keep my car longer? Is there the opportunity to downsize? Do I really need this? Because then everything you save and don't have to spend, that's more money to put into retirement now that many years earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I am passionate about getting rid of your debt because, mm -hmm. I mean, up to possibly your mortgage. I don't have a problem with people keeping their mortgage if they feel like that is what's going to work better for them. But, oh my goodness, all that other debt, it's like, it's just, to me, it is a retirement killer. If your money comes in the door and it immediately goes out under somebody else's name. Yeah, so it's too, like, it's a yes. lot of extra stress. And with everybody, like more and more people are feeling burnout and anxious. And I think those two are probably correlated. So mm -hmm. that was one mm -hmm. of our reasons for getting rid of debt is it just, we sleep better at night. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. No, it, I fully understand that. Yeah. It has a far reaching effect more mm -hmm. than more than people think. I mean, there's, and especially when you buy a car or anything large, then the salesman is looking at whether or not you can afford the payments. And that's the way yeah. a lot of people look at things is I, and we did that in our earlier years, we did that. If we could afford the payments, then we could quote, afford the item. I'm doing air quotes here. Yeah. And, which was not at all the way to evaluate a purchase. 
buying a car in cash that that'll make you appreciate like I don't really need that. So that that was a a real learner when we bought our last one cuz the one I had in college, like our cars are 15, 10 years old. So mine's still the one I had in college and that one I bought in finance like on a loan. And I still got it cheap because I was in college and didn't have much to get with. But when we bought our cash car at the dealership, there was a lot more like, we'll wait. Like, you can you give us a better deal? Because I'm about to hand you a really big check. And that mm-hmm. hurts. <laughs> like, that hurts a lot more than a payment coming out of our account. So it does make you more mindful over your spending as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so now let's go on to rung five, establish your flashpoint. Yeah, so once you've put out the dumpster fire, now you get to transition and start building your freedom fire, which is probably everybody else's fun part. Not Most people aren't as excited about the budget as I am. So this is where you establish your flashpoint. You want to decide what is your future going to look like, and this is where you start putting the money to it and where you really start assessing those opportunity costs we just talked about like either moving up in housing or down in housing or changing jobs knowing what you want where you're at and what you're hoping to plan for can help you better assess those options and opportunities and this is where again it's very personal because what you need to make your fire vision, a reality is vastly different from someone else. For example, if you're planning on a fat fire retirement, that is very different than how much you need to save intentionally versus a lean fire or someone who just wants normal financial independence, especially for late starters, like the retire early part isn't as much in the equation. It's like, what kind of lifestyle do you want to have in your retirement? And then, okay, what do we need to start saving that? So you're matching your goals with your vision for that financial independence. All right. Let's try and move through the remainder of our rungs a little quickly because we want to get to the mechanics, right? Mm -hmm. You are a mechanics engineer on budgeting. (laughs) Ring six is fuel your future save for retirement, and align your career. This is where the rubber meets the road. You figure out your savings rate, and then you, you know, this is typically the honeymoon phase where you're like all on fire. And I remember being there uh, and it's like, yes, I got this, we can do it. And you get your plan up and running, and then you hit the middle. But tell us about when you get your plan up and running, what do you need to do? Yeah, that starts with your budget. Everything for me starts with the budget. You need to figure out, get an idea of how much you need to save, like a percentage a year or amount a month, and get that put into your budget. We like to set that up on automatic payments so that it's always coming out. And we always throw whatever's left at the end of the month into like our savings. But for the retirement portion in the tax advantage plan, like that is always one of the top ones after we made sure we're taking care of transportation and like housing and food to make sure we can work and we don't starve. We don't end up homeless. Like that's the next one that we budget. We know the money's got to go to the Ross. The employer match gets taken out before we even see it, which is a a great way to make sure we don't spend it. So we kind of make sure we're paying ourselves first and paying it like an automatic bill to ourselves instead of someone else, Mm -hmm. which is really nice. Mm Mm-hmm. And when you pay down your debt with the remainder after that, that's what happens when it's gone is uh, what I found is all of a sudden that's what goes to taxable savings. Uh, You transition into that down these savings buckets. We call it a cash flow waterfall. Mm -hmm. And we did a great episode with Sarah Catherine Gutierrez on cash flow waterfall and what are the priorities of savings and how does it flow down to the next one? So I encourage people to go back to that episode. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. as you're getting closer to when you want to retire, that's where you start saving more in in cash too. So you can ride out those waves in the stock market as well. Like Mm -hmm. it won't be your emergency fund, but you'll probably want to have like a year or two saved up in cash. So if your investments are down 20%, you don't have to pull them out while they're down. You can use your cash and ride out till they come back up and then you can skim off the gains. 
Right, right. We're in that stage of the game where basically we're doing a barbell allocation where all of our retirement's going to stocks, but at the same time, whatever's left over and taxable, we're putting to cash. Yep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're not buying bonds. Not a great time to do so, but we're buying stocks and cash mm -hmm. because we're at the point where we need that cash buffer. So we're building that up on one end of the risk spectrum and on the other end of the secure spectrum. Mm -hmm. People will get to that point, but uh, it takes a little work. Mm -hmm. Right. And in rung seven, this is not necessarily about the numbers, but it is still extremely important. So tell us about rung seven. So this is where you stoke the flames. You kind of bring your family and your friends, your kids into the journey with you. And I think that's another great way to help you succeed. Like you've built your community early, but you can have an accountability partner here that, especially if you're single, who's kind of on a similar path, just keep checking in with and to celebrate with. And I'm a big believer that you get out of life what you put into it. So if you're willing to share your journey and what's helped you succeed with others, like you guys do with the podcast, others are more likely to help you when you need it as well and to save you from future pitfalls, whether it be money or something else. Ours was car troubles recently. <laughs> Yeah, and what we find that our community on Facebook, which is growing exponentially, is a great place to do that. Yeah. It's a safe place, and people are being transparent mm -hmm. with their emotions, with their numbers. They're asking great questions, and we have a lot of experts in the community that just want to help. And we have these long threads now of somebody asks a question as an anonymous member, which is fine, but I think personally, when you come on as yourself and you give that up where it's that you're vulnerable, yeah. then you have the most to gain, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Right. And I think that this is really important because even for us late starters, this process is going to be a long haul. Yeah. This is a crock pot, not a microwave. And so it's... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I'm sorry. I, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't heard that one before. This is a crock pot, not a microwave. Is that one? Is that one you make up? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't I know where that's I've heard from. It. Maybe Ramsey. I was going to say that probably that came one. from Dave yeah. Ramsey. Yeah, yeah, it probably came from Ramsey. So, which we have that in common, also. Mm -hmm. But you're going to get discouraged. I want our audience to yeah. hear that you're going to get discouraged. But that doesn't mean that you're going to fail and that you'll never make it. You just need some encouragement. And that's what our community does. But then it's also nice to have real a real person in the flesh yeah. there with you to, to help you. Because if you have an accountability partner, then you're helping each other. You not only receive help, but you're there to give it when that person needs it. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, I love that. Yep, yep. And this is also where the FI community and the FI events come in. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, this may air after economy, but we're going to have a catching up to FI meetup, and we have somewhere between 15 and 20 people that are going to be there. We have a late starter breakout where you can meet your other late starters. Mm -hmm. And Becky and Jack, you're going to lead it this year, and I'll be the heckler in the crowd <laughs> if I wasn't ready. A comedy won't have happened yet. So yes, I encourage anybody that can to go to economy, or if not, then uh, check out one of the Camp 5 events around the country. Sure. Or even a local event. If you are in a position where you really don't need to spend money going to an event, then go to a local meetup. And if there's not one, start one. They're so yeah. easy to do. Stephen and I have had the local Colorado Springs Choose FI group here at our house, and it's easy. Yeah, and we have actually had local meetups and catching up to FI. It's starting. The fire mm -hmm. is starting, and we encourage people to create a chat in the group and meet your friends. Yeah. Meet your FI friends and uh, meet your late starter friends so that you can help each other along the journey. Right, right. All right, rug number eight. What's that? Wait. You have achieved your fire, or for catching up with FI, you have achieved your FI. So you are at the top, you have climbed the ladder, you are free. So make sure that you celebrate it, but also be mindful to stay the course. Like I still recommend budgeting here to make sure that your bowling ball doesn't suddenly swerve into the gutter from mismanaged spending. 
Mm-hmm. My wife still uses bumpers. She, <laughs> she can't throw the ball straight down the lane for the life of her. <laughs> I did. Um, and that's what the budget is, school. right? It's the bumpers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Your budget is the bumpers. And as a, right. that's where we want to go next is talking specifically about the budget because mm-hmm. – for Lauren, I know for you and, and me both, that's the basis for how we get all of this to work. Some yes. people don't like budgeting. Some people do. Some people do it reluctantly. Mm-hmm. But so we want to talk about what a budget is, why you need to do it, and what might it look like. So first question, who needs a budget? Everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. (laughs) But yes, I do think everybody can benefit from a budget because it is something I tried to highlight with the fire ladder that helps you with every step along the way. Even once you're financially sound, it's still, like we said, it's those rails, the bumpers to keep you on the path. What could a budget do for, if I am... Sally in our audience, and I'm listening to this, and I'm not convinced. So what can a budget do for me? So your budget, I think we might have talked or hit on this a little bit, is like a GPS. It gives you the roadmap from where you are to where you want to go, and it helps you spend your money intentionally because a lot of people think like wealth is how much money you earn and I think there is some truth for that like it's hard to become wealthy if you're living in poverty but there is a certain income point and I think it's always less than people assume it is where making more money doesn't count as much as what your outflow is so it's your spending that's really powerful in your wealth generation and your budget really helps you do that intentionally so it is a great accelerator for your fi journey Mm, okay all right so another question that someone in our audience might be asking is won't i feel controlled by a budget like to me it sounds like handcuffs So I get that a lot. And I think my husband actually did that, which is why for the longest time I did it myself before I invited him into the process. But I actually think that the budget gives me more power over my money. Like instead of my money controlling me month to month, I am in control of it and I'm telling it what to do. And when your money has a job, like the more work you give your money, the less time you have to work for to earn it. And I think the budget gives me more permission to spend once I've set out my plan. Like I'm a natural saver and so is my husband. So he's been known to send me texts asking if he can stop at Best Buy to pick up a certain video game. And the next text I get is, it's in the budget. (laughs) And so it's like, (laughs) yeah, we have money left over. Absolutely, go get it. So I actually find freedom in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I was a spender. And interestingly enough, I have become a saver. So I know that people sort of have these natural tendencies of spender or Mm -hmm. saver. And I definitely was a spender. Now, I tried to look at what we had and not spend more than I thought we had. But the problem was we had never made a plan and we had never saved any money. And the thing that threw us over the cliff financially was when, if people have heard my story, they'll know that we had an issue with the the company that Stephen had. And what threw us over the cliff financially was we had no emergency fund. We had no savings of any kind. And so we had not been like spending more than we made, but we hadn't been saving anything. And so the fear and the trauma that that caused me actually turned me from a spender into a saver. And now I can't imagine living without a budget, even in retirement. Like you said, it's still my guardrails. But one of the things that happened to me when we first started this process was Stephen and I knew we had to do something, but we didn't know what it was. And we Mm -hmm. still weren't, quote, on the same page, Mm -hmm. which I think is extremely important for if you have a partner that the two of you are on the same page. And so not only 
did the budget feel constrictive? But to me, it felt like it could be used as a weapon. It would be if if I tried to live by a budget or tried to create a budget and then I couldn't live on it, then my spouse might hold that against me in some way. And I just want to tell people in the end, that is not the case. The budget is something that you have control over. You're not going to be perfect with it, with every expenditure and every month, but it still is something that's going to lead you into going in the right direction. And all of the fears that I had about it were completely unfounded. It didn't turn out to be that way once I started. Yeah. And then you recommend, there are lots of different kind of budgets. And I found, and and I don't know if you use the zero-based budget Mm -hmm. or a version of the 50, 30, 20 budget, but can you talk about zero-based first? And then you have a lot of interesting variations on the fundamental 50, 30, 20 budget. Can you you take us through all those? Yeah. So I do. I like the zero-based budget. For years, I did more of like a tracking style than a budget without realizing it. Like I took what our estimated annual income was, divided it by 12, and then that was our budget for the month. But then I didn't actually do anything with it until the end of the month when I reconciled like our bank statements and credit card statements like, oh, guess what? We overspent. Whoopsie. So we did okay that way. But when we switched to the zero-based budget, it was like a light switch. And that is really what propelled us and helped us pay off Mm. the house like a year and a half earlier than we thought we were going to. And it has accelerated our overall FI journey. So with the zero-based budget, you take your income minus your expenses. And every month for that specific month, it equals zero. And that doesn't mean you spend every dollar that you make. A lot of that for us goes into savings. So we have a line item for our Roth IRAs. We have a line item for my individual I-401k. We have a line item for our Norway sink fund. We have a line item now for our Colorado move fund and house fund. So a lot of that can be savings but every dollar gets a job and you give it the marching orders and then it goes to work for you. And then like you mentioned, the 50, 30, 20 budget is kind of a staple in personal finances. That's 50% wants, 30% needs, 20% savings. And I think that's a good baseline if you're brand new and haven't done a budget before. But like we've talked about, personal finance is very personal. So for a lot of situations, it doesn't fit the bill. If you're catching up with FI, you're probably going to want your needs to, or sorry, it's 50% needs, 30% wants, 20% savings. So you're going to want your needs to be less than 50%. The smaller you can make that, the more money you have to pivot to savings. And so you really want that savings to be higher and your your needs to, to be less. And we see that case, like I think I have the example of Octomom. Like Octomom's going to have higher needs than, than other people because she's got eight kids to put through school. So their wants might be a little bit smaller and their savings will probably be a little bit smaller. But the savings one is, is kind of the one I like to put over, put in glass and have like a break in case of emergency where I try to keep that at like 15 to 20 percent just so we're not stealing from the future to fund the present. and But then in, in different situations in life, sometimes it has to adjust, but we try to keep that holy grail at like 15 to 20%. That is your fire alarm when yeah, you put it in glass and yeah. you break it. Now I have a new term yes. for you. You've <laughs> got to incorporate fire alarm into your uh, philosophy. I, guess. I like that. Do you have any other 50, 30, 20 variations based on other people's situations? We have one that we coined with the budget Beagle. That's the bare bones budget. That is where when you're paying off debt, your basically wants drops almost to nothing. Your savings goes to take your employer match and everything else gets chunked of that high interest debt. Got it. Got All it. Right. So, Lauren, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly because I haven't done one like this before. So mm-hmm. it's 50 needs, 30% is the wants, 20% is the savings. 
Yeah, that's kind of like the standard template a lot of people use in personal finance. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then when you have these different situations, you're adjusting one up and then then another has to go down in that case. Because it's obviously it's all got to add up to 100 percent. Okay. All right. Just wanted to make sure I understood and, that. And I'm in that I'm in that tracking mode. I'm in what I call the reverse budget mode, or maybe you call it the anti-budget, where I'm stuck in tracking. I, I, I tried using YNAB and zero-based budgeting, and maybe we want to talk about a few apps that we recommend for folks. But tracking works for us because there are months where we have a variable income, mm-hmm. and uh, there are months where we spend more than other months. And what I do is savings always comes first and maxing out savings based on whatever savings rate we need to reach FI as late starters. And then if we spend a little more, then less goes to the taxable account. Uh, And I'll at the end of the month, take as much until it hurts and put it towards taxable. So it, 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 it does work for us. And I think it tends to work more for higher income earners because we have that flexibility. We have a buffer. We have that bigger shovel. But, uh, you know, and for lower to mid-income earners, I think the, the, the standard zero-based budget or the 50, 30, 20 variations work really well and are critical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Lauren, if, if someone has never done a budget before, how do you start? I like to start by getting an idea of your income. If your salary, that's pretty easy. You know what you're going to bring home, how many paychecks you're going to have in a month. If you have variable income, like I do now and I've had in the past, I always try to base mine off of what I know is guaranteed. And then kind of like Bill mentioned, everything over that is is like fluff. It's wonderful. And we can add it to the budget later. But I want to know what's the absolute minimum I have to work with, and I base my budget off of that. Once you know your income, then you start looking at your expenses. And to get an idea when you're doing your first budget, I like to go back and learn past few months of spending. So basically your bank statements, your credit card statements. See where all your money went so you can start planning your expenses with your known regular payments. So like your bills, your minimum payments on debt and see what you've generally spent in more flexible ones. Like what did we spend on entertainment? What did we spend on groceries? What did we spend on vacation? And then you can kind of use that to make your first budget. Again, the first couple will will be hard. It's a bit like riding a bike. You're gonna bust it on the pavement the first few months. So I like to pad your budget like you pad your elbows and your knees on a bike. So, and again, grace, Give yourself grace and patience with the process. But once you've got your template for your first budget, then keep track of the budget throughout the month to see where you're actually spending it this month. And you had mentioned different apps. You can make a spreadsheet. You can use an app. I like the free version of every dollar because I'm frugal. You can do it old school style with a pen and paper. And I say the best budget for you is whichever is easiest for you to maintain and keep up with. And then there are other apps that I'm aware of, and there's going to be a lot more that I hope folks drop into the community. But there's Monarch, which is basically taken taken over for Mint, which is going okay. away. Mm-hmm. People use Quicken. People, I use Simplify, yep. which is a Quicken product. There's also Tiller, which gives you more access to spreadsheets. And then there's YNAB, which mm-hmm. is the gospel of zero-based budgeting. And there's lots of resources out there, you included, that can help you figure this out. And there's folks that make a living on creating YouTube videos and how to take you through this and uh, how to deal with special situations. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big app person. I like to follow them that way and automate that kind of stuff. And I'm not a pen and paper and I'm definitely not a spreadsheeter. (laughs) Challenge, the the challenge I have is the spousal buy-in where my wife turns everything over to me and to do a zero-based budget with YNAB, for example, they have to be engaged, I think, with putting things in and Mm -hmm. the cash expenditures and following it so that they know they've reached a max. Sarah Catherine Gutierrez uses zero-based cash flow where she'll set a budget for the week. 
say for a food budget, and if they get through their food budget budget because they go out to eat, they're rice and beans on Sunday. Yeah. And she does, she's a high income earner. So they just raid the pantry and shop at home, which is yeah. one way of frugally shopping. Shop your closet, shop yeah. your pantry, and don't go out to eat. Uh, those are the things you have to be willing to do, and you can do them in a fun way. Have a potluck where you have people over instead of going out to eat. So there's lots of creative ways that you can stick to a budget and not make it painful or restrictive. Right, right. I like those ideas because that that addresses the my question of well, what happens if you can't get everything to fit in? So, I mean, obviously, something would have to change under those circumstances. You have to start making possibly some hard choices. But I think that's something that that if folks are doing a budget for the first time, don't be surprised if you write everything down and it ends up being a bigger number than your than your income. Have you experienced that, Lauren? Yeah, the the first things we prioritize are like the essentials. So you're food, your shelter, your transportation to work to make sure you can make that money to come home. And then I would work your way down the list of others. So like your bills, what do you have to stay current on? What are your minimum debt payments for now? Um, try to pay yourself first still, but if you're in that first budget, we might have to, to work some things around. And in those situations, I always recommend auditing your spending to see why you can't fit anything in. And if it's a situation where you have variable income, then that is where sink funds can come into play because you need to save heavily in the good months to help ride out the lows of the slow months. Mm. And that's where going back and kind of checking traditionally how much money and that's why I like to try to base off the lowest income that is gonna guarantee come in um, but like you said sometimes that's where you have to sit down and really evaluate assess the smoke of the situation it's like what do we have to get out of to make this make sense and for this to work for us instead of against us mm -hmm. One of the ways I know that our tracking or budgeting is on fire is if Amazon boxes are showing up religiously at the <laughs> front door. We got rid of Prime. And let me tell you, that saved a lot of money for Colorado. Yeah. Well, we have an Amazon uh, category in our expense tracking, and I do follow that. And my wife loves books, too, except she loves new books. <laughs> yeah, she, she has a library card. And yes. uh, the one-click or one-swipe shopping, she's up at night and can't sleep. And all of a sudden, I see a couple of emails coming from Amazon the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's a least... good tip that we've had that we've done. One, we turned off the one click and we've turned off where it doesn't save the credit card. Like, put those road gaps for the bad habits in for yourselves. And one thing we did was, okay, when I get in those, because I'm an emotional spender myself. So when I get into those seasons... I have to let it sit in the cart overnight. And it's like, do I mm -hmm. really still want it in the morning or has like the dopamine hit worn off? And it's like, you know what? That's actually go ahead and just delete it or save for later. And it sits in the cart for mm -hmm. two months before I eventually delete it. Yeah. The funny thing is if I put it in the cart, I never buy it. As yeah. soon as I put it in the cart, I, I really don't go back to that. And it, spending is a very emotional thing. But now savings is emotional for me. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to save. Yeah. I can't wait to buy myself an index fund. If, if I receive a gift of money for whatever reason, my birthday or whatever, I'm like, that's extra. I'm buying shares. Yeah. And that, that gets me excited. Well, and like <laughs> Becky mentioned being a spender before and the budgets made her a saver, the budgets actually kind of helped in the reverse for me because I have more of like that money, like, oh, what if it's not there just from stability in the past? But having the budget has helped me kind of spend a little bit more because then I see that money in the entertainment budget and I'm like, oh, we haven't spent that yet. It's like, oh, they're, they're doing a concert this this weekend. We've got money left over. We should go. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Like just like last weekend that happened to us, the Wiz was playing downtown at the theater and we're like, should we go down and go to the Wiz? And we thought about it and said, well, we've seen it before. Yes, it's fun. It's exciting, but it's $300. Should we go to a movie? No, don't really feel like going out now. 
let's just watch Netflix at home and have dinner at home and go to a movie in our, go to a movie in our pajamas. So <laughs> and all of a sudden we've saved three or four hundred dollars. Yeah, I like between that. dinner out and going to a show. If you just sit with it, think about it, and what do you really want? Because just like Paula Pant says, everything is a trade-off, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. or money. If you choose one thing, you have to not choose another thing. Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. You know, Bill, right, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that, like we've just talked about several ways to save money if you need to, or to spend money if it's fitting in the budget. I think we should start a thread in the Facebook group of let people throw in their ideas of how they have found ways to save to squeeze a little bit more juice out yeah. of their budget. Because I know that the folks in the late starter community, we're, we are all having to possibly make some decisions we haven't made for the last 40 years of, oh, maybe I can't do that. Just we spend on automatic and now we're having to stop and think about it. So, yeah, we, we should start a thread maybe of some money-saving ideas, money-saving tips. Well, it's the automatic spending that we got to watch. You need to really audit your spending, mm -hmm. say, every three months. What are those subscriptions? What are those things you got caught up into that come out monthly that are running yeah. in the background just like your savings? Those are the leaks in the boat that sink you in over the long term. Mm -hmm. Folks talk about the car being the retirement buster. You do have to watch out for the $30,000 expenses. But my matcha green tea latte that I will, <laughs> will surge, this is the latte factor, right? Especially when you have less income uh, to play with. If you're getting a latte every day, the inflationary component of this is amazing. Ten years ago, the the drink that I got was like four fifty. <laughs> now it's six bucks, and the profit margin there is astronomical. Mm -hmm. And make it at home, right? It, it's thirty cents, and, and that compounded over time is opportunity cost, as we've talked about before. Right. Let's talk a minute before we wrap things up with your reverse top 10 list about a term that you bring up that I think is critical. We talk about happiness, but you really talk about contentment. Can you take us through why contentment is so important? Yes. So I've found when you aren't content with your life or your current situation, you may find yourself constantly chasing that feeling. And that usually results in throwing money after stuff or after like events in an attempt to buy happiness and that rarely works so finding contentment and where you are and what you already have can be a great way to accelerate your fi journey and just to lower stress lower spending just overall is, is good for life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lauren if someone is having problems with that. And I know I experienced that because I had been used to spending and suddenly I didn't have any money. And life basically had to change because we had no choice. We had driven our car off the cliff and we had no choice. So is contentment something that can be learned? Yeah. I think it's similar to budgeting. You kind of have to ease into it and practice patience and grace with yourself. One of the things that helped for me is to learn to like reframe and refocus your goals and your desires. And a really big one is to stay away from the comparison game. So like I love to travel. So I try to avoid Instagram where everyone is posting their beautiful holiday pictures. So the fact that one of my friends gets to go to the Swiss Alps shouldn't affect how much fun I had freezing my butt off in Maggie Valley. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right, Becky, this is another budgeting term. You don't want to Thelma and Louise your budget where you drive off the cliff. Maybe some of our audience doesn't remember the movie Thelma and Louise, but uh, you want to stop before the cliff and then get it into reverse. Right, um, right. We're coming to the end of our show, and uh, you have a top 10 list, but you list it in reverse order. So it's a 10 to 1 list. Can you take us through that? And this, that'll be a summary for what we've talked about today. Yeah. So these are like the top 10 tips we wish we learned earlier in our FIRE or FI journey. 
So number 10 is sinking funds are your friends. Yes! <laughs> number nine. <laughs> number nine is do a zero based budget. Number eight is to shop and renegotiate your monthly and annual expenses frequently. And you can kind of rope your subscriptions into that as well. Number seven, capitalize on tax advantaged retirement accounts. Number six is spend some time learning and understanding investments because you don't want to invest in something you don't understand. Number five, set up your retirement like an auto pay bill to yourself. Number four, and I think Becky really mentioned this one, both spouses need to be in agreement, both on the monthly budgeting and in the investing decisions. Mm -hmm. Number three is focus your money where it matters to you. Number two is memories are made in moments, and they usually have a better ROI than any other investment. And number one, the top financial tip we wish we'd learned earlier was, while it's great to build wealth, never forget your why. That's awesome. I love we it. We hadn't talked about number two, but I, I love the memory dividends. We're going to have to talk or try and talk with Die With Zero author Bill Perkins. Mm -hmm. That would be a great guest on the show. Yes. So these, and what's nice or rewarding to me is, I think we've touched on most of these in our podcast, Becky. Mm -hmm. Looking at this list, I think the, the, these things have been our focus and continue to be our focus. So it brings me joy that this list is something that's part of our mission. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. This is great. This is great. So Lauren, tell us, you, you mentioned that you are about to move. So where are you now? Are you still working? Are you, where are you on your fire or fi journey? Yes. So if you've seen office space, we don't have enough money yet for FI to show our pieces of flair and walk out the door, but we're on our way. So we're in those rungs six and seven on the fire ladder. I was able to cut back last year on my hours and shift jobs. I get to work remotely now. I actually pivoted careers completely which has been really fun working in content creation and education. I was able to start the budget brigade. And so with our house paid off, we've been able to do a lot more of those opportunities. And so we are also in the process of reaching that first of our big goals of moving out to out West. So we're really excited. Nice. Tell us a minute about the budget brigade, because I think you do coaching. I think it's part of your side hustle, which maybe you want to be your main hustle. But tell us about your website, the budget brigade, and what our audience might glean from it. Yeah. So our main hub at the budget brigade is thebudgetbrigade.com. We have articles about budgeting, about frugal fun, financial advice we've learned from pop culture, because I'm a bit like Bill. We spend a lot of time just staying at home, eating dinner, and watching a lot of Netflix and TV. And then we cover other stuff like retirement, advice for entrepreneurs and small business, since I have that background. We do coaching for budgeting sessions as well for people that are really stuck and just need help with that first budget getting into the, the process. Well, I think that sounds great. And I know that you have probably helped a lot of folks and I'm encouraging our audience to definitely check out the Budget Brigade. And so where, where can people reach you if they want to reach out? Yep. So the website's the main hub. And again, that's thebudgetbrigade.com. We also have Instagram at Budget Brigade. And then we have a Facebook group that is the Budget Brigade, which is facebook.com slash groups slash Budget Brigade. But you'll see our little icon and our slogan of turning dumpster fires into freedom fire. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, let's not smash and pull the fire alarm. Let's follow <laughs> uh, the lessons that we've had today. Uh, we want to thank you uh, from the bottom of our late starter hearts for joining us today and taking us through budgets mm -hmm. for 2024. Don't forget to look on the Facebook group where Becky has transparently shared her numbers. We encourage folks to be transparent in their journey because it will help people trust you 
and find an accountability partner that you lock hands and work through this together. It's what we're all about. All right. Thanks so much for being here, Lauren. Thanks we look again forward to for talking having to you again me. soon. <laughs> and thanks for reaching out. Thanks to BC Krigowski for uh, connecting us. And good luck with your move to Colorado. I'm yes. a little jealous because <laughs> my kids are both in Colorado. We got married in Colorado. Tennessee is great. We do dream of the mountains, though. <laughs> so you have to let me know when you get here. <laughs> Absolutely. And thanks again for having me. Awesome. All right. Till next time on Catching Up to Five. Thanks again, guys. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Catching Up to Five. We would appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review so that our message can reach others. We are not lawyers, financial advisors, accountants, or tax experts. Please consult your own professional advisors before making any important decisions. Our content is for entertainment and education purposes only. We'll see you next time on Catching Up to Five.